hello and welcome. Um, this is the first time that we're hosting one of our educational conferences this way. Um, so we're glad to have you all with us. Um, we're a little surprised by how many people have signed up and we're really excited about that. Um, for those of you that know um, MAP, the Massachusetts Animal Coalition, um, this is not news to you, but for those of you that are new to MAP, um, I imagine a lot of you are since we've got over 700 people, almost 800 people registered for this. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an intro into MAC and who we are. Um, we're a statewide non-for-profit that was formed almost 21 years ago um, to promote collaboration among animal welfare professionals and volunteers in the state of Massachusetts. Um, our mission is to maintain a leadership role within the state and um, to help the animal welfare community uh, to collaborate and to basically just help improve animal welfare in the state of Massachusetts. Um, our members are really diverse, um, includes veterinarians, um, shelter professionals, animal control officers, independent rescuers and um, volunteers and people that just love animals. And um, our board has several task forces and programs. The one that you guys are probably most familiar with are the um, I'm Animal Friendly license plates that you see on all the cars. Um, those support our statewide spay neuter grants that we uh, grant out every year. Um, we have other programs like Animatch, which helps move animals from shelter to shelter across the state of Massachusetts, shelter statistics, um, a number of other programs, and then including our educational workshops. So normally when it's not a pandemic, what we've done in the past is that we had meetings, one day meetings um, that we would hold at Tufts on a certain topic. We have three meetings a year about one on cats, one on dogs, and um, one on a general topic. But we're switching everything up this year um, because everything has changed. And um, we'll be offering a series of workshops just like this that we'll host online, um, usually for about an hour or so, probably on the evening, some of them during the day at work, just kind of mixing it up a little bit. But um, this is the first one that we're starting and um, we're really glad to see you all here. And um, we'll send you more emails now that we know who you are <laughs> and we have your email address um, and we'll be inviting you to more as we do these periodically throughout the year. So thank you for being here. and. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily. Thanks, Julia. Um, I'm Dr. Emily McCobb. I'm a former Mac board president and um, on the um, advisory board wherever they send old Mac presidents to live. Um, I am on the faculty here at Cummings School and the Center for Animals and Public Policy um, is co-sponsoring this um, Mac CE. And we're super excited to help Mac out um, and use our platform so we can get so many um, shelter folks attending. Um, and it looks like it's gonna work really well for folks. So Mac, I think should be doing some more of these. I have a few thank yous. I want to thank um, Michelle for being here. I'm going to introduce her in a second and thank Julia for having the idea and kind of being super persistent despite all the obstacles um, that we have going on. And then um, Ginny, my assistant, has done a ton to help us get used to the platform. Um, Alana and Adrian from the Mac board did all the registration. So thanks a lot to all those folks for helping out. So um, for anyone that's new to this platform, hasn't done um, the Zoom webinars before, the way it's going to work is all of you guys are actually muted and um, can't chat with each other. You can chat to us, the panelists. Um, please use the chat if you have any technical um, issues or logistical questions um, or anything like that. If you have a question for Michelle, our speaker, please put that in the q and I'm going to keep an eye on those. And Michelle would like to answer as many questions as she can at the end of her talk. Um, any little simple things I can take care of, I will as we go, but for the most part, we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, thanks for your patience. We um, had a few technical difficulties to work out, but seems, things seem to be working okay. Um, and then she does have some videos, which um, I think you guys are going to get a lot out of as she talks about this really important topic. So without any further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce you guys to Michelle Damon. Um, Michelle is a certified veterinary technician, and she's also a veterinary technician specialist um, in the area of emergency and critical care. She works in our ICU here at Tufts. She's actually been here almost 25 years. Um, we're both about the same vintage, so we're sort of feeling a little old, a little long in the tooth, but it's okay. Um, Michelle works with our students in the ER and the ICU, and um, she also teaches our students in their clinical 
technical skills, animal handling classes. And over the past several years, she's developed a special interest in trying to make the animals experience, particularly cats, better when they come in to see us. So she's um, Fear Free certified and um, she has this interest in low stress handling and really excited to talk about how you can use some of these principles with your animals in shelters. So um, take it away, Michelle. Hey, um, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and start with this quote that I really like. Um, oops, sorry. Sometimes you have to click on your slides and then try the arrow. Sorry, I'm not used to this computer. There, you go. Okay, there we go. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is just this qu quote that I got from the American Association of Feline Practitioners, which is a really, a really great resource for everybody um, as far as you know, looking into um, cat friendly things. They they have a lot of good information on their website, but the the approach to the cat in a way that will result in delivering the most effective care. So just basically trying to get the most out of our cats that we can um, in, whatever, in whatever way we need to. Um, so this is my overview. Um, basically the way I, I approach this, this topic is that I really um, try to understand the way cats view the world. Um, so going through that, I try to understand their senses. We try to understand their behavior. Um, and how, how all these things affect them and how they react to those things in different situations. So my approach is that I really want to try to catch cats before they become difficult. So I'm um, trying to understand what, how they're seeing the world and trying to make things easier on them so that they're not becoming difficult cats. Um, so we'll go through all these, these different things about understanding their senses, um, looking at some behavior assessment, um, how they react to stress and how stress reacts to them. And then looking at some environmental changes that we can do to alleviate their stress. And then we'll talk about some low stress handling and, um, and um, what, their, what the benefits of low stress handling is and what methods we'll use to, with low stress handling. So really what is fear free? Um, fear free is trying to have low stress handling, right? Um, and also trying to build stress, build trust with our patients or our, with with the, the cats that we're working with. Um, and if we can have them cooperate with us, that's the best thing. Um, so if they can um, build enough trust to cooperate with us with whatever we're doing, that is going to benefit all of us. Um, making positive experiences in their day to day life um, and, and focusing on their emotional well being. So when I think about low stress I, and how I handle my patients, I think about priorities and um, the priorities I think about number one is safety. So we think about our safety. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want any of our coworkers to get hurt. We don't want our patients to get hurt. Um, so safety is first. Um, and then the patient's physical health. So if whatever we need to get done for our patients has to be done at that moment, um, because of their physical health, then that has to be done. And then our patient's emotional health is our third uh, priority. So making sure that they're having an, a, a positive experience. So basically I don't wanna compromise number one or two to get number three. Um, so as much as I am 100% behind low stress handling and patient emotional health, I wanna make sure everybody's safe and that we're making sure our patients are are um, gonna be healthy through everything. So these are the senses that I think about when I think about um, our patients is hearing, um, smell, taste, touch, vision, and pheromones. And we'll go through each of those in the, the next um, oncoming slides. So cat's hearing is five times more acute than humans. It's, uh, it's in an intense amount of, um, it's really crazy how much they can hear. They can hear like most footsteps on the floor. Um, their muscles and their ears can move 27 different ways. 
Um, they have a lot of aid in hunting. Um, so thinking about that, do you want to you want to think about how that impacts their life um, when you're working with them and there's doors shutting and um, and and people walking around and there's a lot of noise that that's really going to impact how they're feeling. And then their smell is five times more than humans. So um, that's a huge thing for them too. If there's alcohol on their um, bodies from whatever we've been doing, or um, there's a lot of cleaning products around, then that's really gonna impact how they're feeling. Um, so we wanna think about, you know, making sure that get, gets off their bodies when we, when we can do that. Um, and they have a lot of scent glands on their heads and their feet. So um, they can, they can, get that from a lot of different places. And familiar smells are comforting. So keeping bedding in the cage that they're used to, if you can, um, and having those things um, is very comforting for cats. So taste is actually one of the least acute senses for cats. They don't really have a very acute taste. Um, and that's important when we're trying to get them to eat something. If you, um, their smell is more, um, acute than their taste. So if you're um, trying to heat up food or getting getting them to eat, um, then then that's more important. So, um, and it's just kind of interesting that they don't have a receptor for sweet taste. Um, touch is very important to cats too. They have their whiskers um, and those are very, um, they have a lot of nerve in induction into their sense, into their um, whiskers. So when you're touching their face or their feet, um, they're very sensitive to that type of touch. Um, it aids in their navigation if they're if they're hunting or anything or trying to go through small spaces. Then then the whiskers are really um, sensitive to that. So um, um, that's important. And of course, it, their individual petting preferences. So a lot of cats are very um, particular about where they're touched on their body. Um, very particular about the time amount of time they're touched. Um, we'll talk about ways to um, to tell if cats are um, becoming intolerant to touch or or any type of um, activity um, in, a, in a little bit. But that's that's very um, important with their individual petting preferences. So if they're starting to look like they're they're done with being touched, then it's important to let them do what 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 they want and to leave. Um, vision, cats have normal, uh, their normal light vision is not all, actually all that good, um, but they have really good peripheral vision and really good low light vision. Um, so that they're, they're good hunters at night. Um, and they have a blind spot about four or five inches from, the, from their face. So that's important when we're working with them as far as um, approaching them from the front. Um, they really don't like that. So approaching them from the side is usually a better, better, um, better approach. Pheromones are very important to cats. So um, this is one of their most, um, most specific and most um, important ways of communicating with each other. So pheromones are naturally secreted, um, very species specific hormones. So no other species can detect these types of things. Um, so they have many uses. I just put a few here. Um, there's several. Um, if you want to look at them more closely, actually, Feel Away has a really good um, a good list of of um, things that that pheromones look that pheromones are used for, and they have a lot of um, good information about pheromones on the Feel Away site. But I picked these off there. Um, so it's marking their territory. It's very self soothing for them. Um, it's they bond between cats, especially between queens and kittens. Um, so different kinds of pheromones that are secreted from different areas. So there's a feline facial pheromone, there's a cat appeasing pheromone. Um, the feline facial pheromone is the main uh, feel away pheromone that's in the in that product. Um, and that's, that's secreted from their face. Um, and that's the one that's more of a um, self-soothing type of thing. Um, so the pheromone is secreted from the vermarial nasal um, um, organ or the Jacobson's organ, which is shown on this little diagram here, um, and that detects the pheromones. Um, actually, it's not secreted from there, it detects 
the pheromones from there. Um, and then you get your synthetic pheromones from products from like Feel Away and there's a couple other um, products out there too. <clears throat> So then we're gonna look at some environmental changes. So we'll look at some cage setup, um, things that we can do. Um, we'll, we already talked a little bit about pheromones, um, probably. And then um, we'll look at some en enrichment toys that we can use for cats and treats. Um, there's music and tablets and social time and some treatment routines. We'll look at some cage card things. <clears throat> so cage card setup, um, our cages in our hospital are actually not really big enough to make this completely effective. But basically, you want to make it so the cats have an area to sleep, an area to urinate and defecate, an area to eat and drink. Um, so if they have, they really want to have separate areas for those things. So if you can separate those things out, they're going to be happier with that situation. Um, as I said, these cages are real small for that to be really effective. But one of the things I really I like to do, and I think cats really like, is this little circular um, blanket situation that this cat has. So if you just roll up a blanket and make it into a circle, they're very happy to just get in there and sleep. Um, I think it provides a really good sense of security for them. Um, so I've had a lot of good success with using that. Um, these are just some pictures of different um, things you can use for um, for hiding boxes and um, and things like that for them. There's there's the blanket situation there that I already talked about. Um, Animal Rescue Site has these little um, hide, perch, and go things that you might guys might or maybe may not be using. Um, and then the bottom right um, picture is a cat in a um, in a little um, hide box that that you can get like. It's just one of those um, Home Depot like organizer things and you just flip it on its side and they can get it under there. And um, those, those work really well. Um, also, um, there's some commercial um, brands that are made too. So enrichment, store, en enrichment toys are really good. Um, I, I'm sure that the cats and shelters get bored um, and, um, and are stressed uh, with, with, their, with their situation. So, Possibly this would really help them to have some enrichment toys for them. Um, so having food delivery toys, there's a bunch of puzzle toys you can buy. There's a ton of things you can do on your own. Um, so these I think are really helpful. My own cat is so much, such a better cat when he has something to do. Um, so um, these things are, are great. Um, music, if you can use music in, in your situation, in your um, shelters, then I, music is really great for cats. I um, have used it a lot in, in my um, my experience on the floor. Um, there's there's actually a species specific music um, that's called Music for Cats, um, put together by David Tay. Um, it's a species specific music that's like purring sounds and like really low um, low volume, really calming kind of thing um, that cats really, really do well with. So um, they did a little study um, and looked at um, some cats with their owners and um, they had some segments of music and looked at whether the cats would actually approach um, the music or be avoidant by it. And they really um, were more approachable with the, with the music. We also use some tablets um, and I, I love this. Um, we have some tablets that we have around um, and we just put on like, um, you know, like either um, birds or squirrels or something the cats can look at. Um, this is really great for cats that are, um, that are active and just don't wanna be in cages and just are really, really want something to do. So if you put these on, a lot of cats will just sit there and watch it. Um, we've, we've had a lot of success with this and it's really actually very rewarding to see them watch these things. Um, a little bit on treatment routines. I find that, um, and it's been shown in studies that consistent caregivers um, are, they, they really, do a lot for animals. If, if, you, if they have the same caregiver each time, then they're going to get a lot more trust from that person. They're gonna feel a lot more um, 
willing to uh, be be um, be able to be treated by that one person. Um, so if you have the same person each time, each um, whether you guys have shifts or not, each shift, um, then that's going to be helpful. Um, also doing the same tasks in the same order. So there's some sort of predictability for that animal. So if you do the same tasks in the same order, uh, sometimes even naming those tasks, um, then they're going to have some sort of ability to, to, to have some consistency in their life. So they're not going, they're, it's going to be safer for them. Um, so less of a fear of the unknown. Um, and hopefully that's going to increase your patient cooperation. Um, these are little cage cards that were developed here at Tufts, um, um, looking at some of the fear-free things. Um, I really like these. They are pretty much have, I, I, I don't know how much you can read through these, um, but they pretty much have descriptions of likes and dislikes and what that patient needs. So, um, you know, whether they're better out of the cage, in the cage, they don't like their feet touched, they don't like their face touched, whatever it is, um, it can be noted on there so that the next person taking care of that cat um, will know what to expect. And, and so that increases patient care and improves patient care and also will, um, will hopefully um, diminish any injuries or, or, you know, things like that. And, and hopefully, you know, develop trust amongst um, between patients and, and caregivers. So um, it might, it might change during the stay. Sometimes, you know, cats may be better with certain things after some time um, and we can change those things, but um, updating those and, and communicating it amongst your coworkers, I think is really important um, and, and helpful in taking care of our patients. Um, so we talked about a little bit about pro providing some hiding options. These are a little bit more pictures of that. Um, same cage and same bedding is helpful if you can because, you know, the, the, as far as um, them being um, used to that smell, uh, having a quiet environment, um, using the um, white noise or soft mu music. Um, amount of handling I put is individual because, you know, obviously there's going to be some cats that are going to really like to be petted and held and other cats who just really don't want that. Um, so you'll be able to tell that. Um, Um, cats are very, very, um, very specific and, and, and worried about anything that's unfamiliar. So if there's anything unfamiliar with their environment, they're really fearful about it. So um, obviously a shelter is going to be worrisome for them in the beginning. Um, cats in the wild only have a small area of, um, of familiarity. Um, they don't they don't have a very wide range of where they're going to be so um so just having that same environment is very is much more calming to them to than um if they're don't know what what they're going to expect so um having familiar blankets in the area um some visits from people that they know um as we talk about continuity of care and some building some trust with them um so some behavior assessment, we know um, it's obvious when cats are hissing and swatting and growling and lunging that they're upset. Um, what we're trying to do is not get them that way. So um, being much more you know, cognizant of the subtle signs of stress is important. So looking at dilated pupils, that their limbs are close to their body, their ears are moving. Um, they have a lot of facial features that are much more accurate um, and, and um, and are going to tell you what's going to happen much quicker than, um, than anything else is like their ears and their eyes that, that their faces are tense. Um, I'll have another slide in a few minutes on that. Um, their body position, whether it's tucked up together, um, their tail is uh, like flicking or you know close to their body. Um, most important is to take in the whole picture. So if you have one cat that's maybe moving their ears a little bit, but is coming towards you and looks happy, um, then you'll take that differently than the cat who's laying in the back, but not really doing anything except flicking its tail. So kick, and it has their body all tucked up. So taking the whole picture is very important. 
Um, this is the feline grimace scale. Um, it's, it was made for pain um, scoring, for pain um, assessment for um, veterinary professionals. Um, but I also find it really helpful to look at cat faces for behavior assessment. Um, so I put this in here for that reason. Um, so basically we're looking at this, these cat faces to see um, how their ears are moving, you know, like if they're up in and forward or to the side or completely to the side and flat, if their eyes are open, shut, almost completely shut, um, whether their whiskers are forward or relaxed um, or completely back, um, whether their faces are tense. And the last thing is about is whether their shoulder, whether their head is above their shoulder or not. Um, if they're completely up like the first cat and they're like alert, or if they're like crouched down or really um, their their head is like below their shoulder. Um, again, this is like looking at the whole picture. Um, so I found this really 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 helpful to look at um, the the whiskers and the um, and the muzzle. Um, tenseness is a little bit hard to detect, I think, in the beginning, but once you start looking at it, I think it's it's actually, it, it really helps once you look at many cats that way. Um, so, for example, I can see my cat's tenseness and their whisker movements very easily now when I look at them, um, and, and also the cats I look at in the hospital. So, uh, I think it just takes a little bit of practice. Um, I think this is a really important concept to look at is as far as how cats are going to react to fear. Um, there aren't any bad cats. There aren't any awful cats. These are all cats who are very afraid um, and they're going to react depending on what, how they, just depending on their personalities, how they're going to react to that fear. Um, so they're either going to want to leave the situation. So if you, are trying to touch them or catch them or do something and they're gonna leave. Um, or they're gonna freeze, which is, I really like the term learned helplessness because to me this means that they're terrified. It's not something where a situation where we're, okay, they're just letting us do what we want in a good way. It's more that they're terrified and we need to treat them the same way we would for a cat that's fleeing or trying to fight us. They're, um, they need help. Um, so, um, and then fighting us when, when the, all else fears fails or if that's just their first, their first way to, to help, to tell us that they're afraid. Um, and then fidgeting. So if they're like just that kitten that's just trying to get away from us, then that's another, another um, outcome or fear. And important to know that all of these things could become um, aggress aggression once, you know, they're pushed too hard. So the cat that's trying to run away from you or the cat that's scared in the back of the cage, um, if we push them too hard, uh, many of them will start um, becoming aggressive. Um, definitely um, any force is going to cause fear. So um, the least amount of force we can do with whatever we're doing with our our animals are is best. So I'm um, always thinking that if we can get them to cooperate, um, that's going to be the best way for all of us. Um, so force equals fear. <clears throat> um, I wasn't going to talk too much about um, the physiological effects of stress. It's it's kind of um, a, a lot, a, a big, a big um, topic, but we'll, we'll just hit on a little bit that it can definitely alter our lab values or vital signs. So if we have, you know, if we, we're getting some blood work and it's a stressed cat, then it's going to change some of those lab values and heart rate's going to get up, go up, their temperature could go up, their respiratory rate could go up. Um, definitely can delay healing from um, cortisol issues. Um, so we want to look at, we want to make that, uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then injury to staff and sedation and stuff like that. And, and we want to make sure um, in your situation that I'm sure you guys are always thinking about trying to get your your pets adopted and um, certainly stressed cats are not going to be as adoptable as um, as happy cats. <clears throat> 
Um, some of the restraint that leads to or increases fear is these things. Um, I look at scratch, scruffing and stretching more than shushing is just a you know noise and staring and cats, they don't like to be looked at straight on and if they're stressed. Um, there's certainly some situations we have to do a little bit of stretching for different procedures, um, but minimal stretching is best. And we'll talk about um, not scruffing and using other ways of, um, of managing the head um, in coming slides here. Um, excuse me. Um, so scruffing, there's still some misnomer out there that scruffing relaxes cats and it really, it doesn't. Um, it might make cats fearful enough to look like they're relaxed because they're in that learned helplessness situation, um, but it doesn't relax them. When they're really young, zero to two weeks, the cat kittens are held by their uh, mom that way. But other than that, mating and fighting and being um, attacked by predators and the only other ways that really cats are scruffed. Um, so obviously those are all very stressful situations. So once a cat is scruffed and they're, you know, that immediately is going to make them stressed um, because they feel like something might, something might happen to them. So keeping that in mind. Um, these are some alternatives to scruffing and stretching. I'll show you some more in the video that we have coming up. Um, I use my hand um, on top of a cat's head, like in the top left picture, where there's my thumb on one side of the head, uh, my um, pinky on the other side, and my other fingers are on the top of the head, and then I just keep it, <coughs> excuse me, I'll keep the cat's head immobilized that way. Um, and some other ways not to, to stretch um, a cat. Um, these are some like uh, minimal restraint techniques that um, that you don't need to like stru um, stretch them down to do any blood work or whatever we're doing here. Um, this is a cowl technique, which is um, I learned from Sophia Yen's um, work. Um, and I've done this many times with um, dogs with brachiocephalic reeds where you don't want to have to like restrain their head too much um, and you, the muscles don't fit very well or whatever. Um, it also works pretty well in cats so you just basically take a towel and wrap it around there uh, by their head and then you twist it in the back um, and you can use that instead of the scruff so you can manage their head with your hand on top of the um, twisted part. Um, so that works pretty well. Um, just a few words about the benefits of low stress handling. So um, we're definitely going to reduce our patient's fear or your um, shelter pet's fears. Um, hopefully be able to get what we need to get done. Um, and again, increase your adoptability. Um, it really does help your job satisfaction. I mean, I, nobody wants to be, be in a situation where having to fight with the animals we're working with to get what we need to get done. Um, it's so much better to have a happy situation between us. Um, and then for sure, fewer injuries. Um, and, um, and it's definitely, you know, just, it's, it's, it's a better thing. We're, we're advancing in, in how we're, do, we're dealing with the animals here. Um, when we're approaching cats, um, we want, like we talked about with the senses, it's, it's, we want to be thinking about quiet movement um, with limited amount of motion because cats are so visual and their hearing is so acute. Um, so we want to try to keep limited motion around them, um, approaching them from the side because of that blind spot. Um, assess and reassess often is very important. So if we're working with an animal in the beginning, they're doing great with what we're doing, then we want to make sure we keep that going. So if we um, if we reassess and things aren't going well, then we need to do something different. Um, or if they're not going well from the beginning, you need to go ahead and do something different. So um, keep reassessing um, very fre frequently. Um, and cats, of course, are better with their head and neck. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, 
I mean, just simple things to consider. You know that the shelter is a stressful environment for cats when they get there, so keep that in mind. Um, and if there's any situation where they're in pain, um, it's going to increase their fear and aggression um, in an anticipatory way. Um, pain and fear is sort, sort of a circulatory thing. So if they're painful, they're gonna be more fearful. And if they're fearful and they have any sort of pain, it's going to be exasperated. So just think about that. Um, certainly treating each patient as an individual um, or each pet as an individual is, is a huge key point. Um, animals just, they, they react to things so much differently than each than another one will. So just be, be aware of those things. Um, and we talked about um, willingness to comply is gonna work better. So if we can get them to, to work with us. Um, and low stress handling, my, a lot of people seem to think, you know, wow, this is really taking me along. It's a lot of, it's a lot to think through and maybe it's taking me more time, but really it's worth the effort. And in the long run, it, it takes less time. So if, um, if we can get them to comply um, and, you know, we can get these things to work, especially after you're used to it, it really doesn't take more time. It takes less time. Um, touch acclimation is a fear-free um, concept that I learned, but I feel like I did most of my career, and I think mo most people do, but maybe making it more of a um, something we think about um, is just that before we start doing anything to an animal, that we make sure that their, the touch shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and that it shouldn't be in the area that's threatening. So if we start touching a patient that has like a broken leg, we don't want to touch that broken leg first. We would touch um, their head and neck first and get them used to us being there. And, um, and then, you know, start gradually working down to that area. It's again, not something that should take a long time. Um, it's just a few seconds, um, but it's, it's really going to be worth your effort um, to get to that point. Um, and then, you know, using some verbal praise or um, food reward as you're going towards that area. Um, individualized care is something I think is hugely important. Um, it, when I started in veterinary medicine, like Emily said, 25 years ago, more than that, because I had some time out of before Tufts, um, I was taught to do everything one way. Um, this is the way you hold to this. This is the way you do this. Um, really, that's completely out of my mind now. Um, I approach each patient differently depending on how they react to what I'm doing. So um, if you're holding a patient and they don't like what you're doing, then you do something different. Uh, so it, whether it depends... It, it, it can be something that's very novel. Um, in this picture, I'm doing a cystocentesis in a cat that's standing because she didn't like being on her side. She was freaking out. Um, so it worked fine. It worked, we got our sample, the cat didn't stress out, nobody get hurt. Um, so it's just, I think, very important to keep in mind that everything doesn't have to be done one way. Um, and, and important to document those things that we talked about before, so. <clears throat> Some of the things we look at for um, feline restraint, um, these muzzles is the ones we have at Tufts. They're like hard um, plastic muzzles. So they go on easily, you can get them on from behind um, and they, um, they can breathe through the front. There's a big hole in the uh, front for them to breathe through. Um, I think muzzles are good for some cats as far as that they're, they aren't, they're, they keep their visual um, stimulation down um, and also sometimes it's helpful with cats that don't want their head touched. So maybe you don't have to do as much restraint on their head because you have it covered. Um, so I, that's the reason why I like those. Um, there's cat gloves. I'm sure you've all worked with those. They're, they're okay. I like blankets better. I just do better um, with, um, with managing cats with blankets. Um, we use e-collars a lot and cats that are in the hospital that are difficult so that we don't have to worry about their, their head as much. Um, 
and using some distraction and reward, reward excuse me. <clears throat> um, getting cats out of the carrier or cage. Um, we'll talk about cages a little bit more in a minute. This is um, more about carriers here. Um, if they'll come out of the cage, the carrier, that's great. Um, we wanna um, avoid shaking or pulling them from the carrier if you can, um, depending on how old the carrier is or how it's put together, it's um, easier or harder to take it apart. But if you can take it apart, that's great. Um, bot bottom picture is just somebody getting a cat out of a carrier with a blanket. I'll show you that a little bit more in the video. And then getting cat, cats, cats from the cage. Um, that's definitely very fear inducing for cats to be reaching in after them like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a time that a lot of bites can happen. I don't have statistics for it, but I think that most of our hospital bites happen getting animals out of cages. A lot of percentage of them do anyway. So you wanna make sure you look at the cat before you're opening the cage. So seeing you know, how they, you think that they might react when you get in there and then um, being you know, um, prepared when you go in um, and approaching slowly and calmly, of course. Um, if they'll come up to you, great. If not, then you wanna like, you know, get them towards the edge of the cage by pulling the blanket out um, and, and then getting them out that way. Um, trying not to put your whole body into the cage because then you're, you're, you're putting yourself more at risk. Um, I like aggressive cats on the top cage for the most time, but sometimes if cats are like leaping at you, it might be better to have them in the bottom cage. So it's kind of a little bit dependent on the situation. Um, this, is, this is more geared towards um, if you're doing treatments on patients. Um, so I, I put this in here because I know some of you do um, do some veterinary care. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about it. Um, what are you thinking about doing treatments on a patient? We wanna think about um, what we want versus what we need um, if they're difficult or they're becoming difficult. So if you have a, a cat that's sort of on edge um, and you're, you're assessing them and they seem like they're getting towards the edge of their um, fuse, um, and I like this, use the fuse wisely, um, we wanna make sure that we know what we really want for um, proceeding. Um, so either sedation and then get a, everything done and we will know we are gonna get everything done or if we're just have a few things to do, but we're worried that maybe they won't do, they won't allow us to do all those three things. Um, I like to have a list in my head about what's needed the most. Um, and then from there I go to, you know, if I have these three things, and I'm, I, I want to get those three things done, um, but which one is the cat going to tolerate the least? Um, then I'll go ahead and, and go from there. Um, and having everything ready so you're not going back and forth another motion thing. So if you um, are going back and forth with a bunch of equipment into whatever treatment area you have with your cat, um, then that's going to set them off a little more if you're like walking back and forth with a bunch of things. So if you have everything together, that's gonna to help you out. Um, also making sure you um, assess yourself. So um, keeping up with, you know, making sure that you, you're you using a, a, a considered approach. So you know, you're taking care of these animals and you're, you're being considerate to them. Um, and also making sure that you are comfortable in that situation. Uh, the two second to attempt rule is a, also a fear-free thing. Um, I'm not sure that that is realistic in a lot of situations, but I think it's important to at least be mindful that you shouldn't keep doing the same thing over and over. Um, so if it's not working, you should be looking at something else. Um, so we're going to look at some handling things now. Um, so I find that cats are often either better with minimal restraint or towel techniques. And it's kind of sometimes hard to just decipher which one they're going to be in the beginning. Um, I think a lot of cats that are good with minimal restraint are cats that are really active and outgoing and they just don't want to be held down. Um, 
So a lot of those cats are better with minimal restraint. Um, and then some of the quieter cats, I think, are better with towel techniques. Um, but it's different. So you just have to um, go by trial and error. Um, and looking at some distraction and reward. Um, and then we'll look at sedation and, and some difficult cat restraint. These are a few pictures of um, towel techniques. They're not like um, true like burrito kind of things that, that some people do, which is fine. Um, but I prefer to just like pretty much cover the cat other than what I need to work on. So these cats, um, are their heads are covered with a blanket um, and, and a hand over their head, just gently over their head, keeping them from moving. And then just the leg is held out for the catheter placement. All right, so this is a video. I'm probably going to skip over a little bit of it because we have a little bit of a time constraint here. Um, but um, I'm gonna talk through some of these handling techniques um, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go forward. Um, so here I'm gonna try to get the cat to come over its cage by itself. Um, he's not going to completely come out, but he seems like a nice cat. Um, so I'm not going to pull him out. I'm not, I mean, I'm not gonna, um, I, I feel okay pulling him out. So I'm pulling him out just by shoulders. Let me shut the carriage because we don't want to get him back in. <clears throat> so this is a minimal restraint um, technique for like jugular venipuncture. Um, so I'm just giving him a little bit of um, distraction here, not the tapping thing that some people do. It's just a gentle um, scratch. And if he didn't like it, he would stop. Um, I can elevate him a little bit there with his legs so that somebody can get a better um, approach to his jugular vein if that's what we're doing. Um, or put him over the edge, but not stretch him. And I'm also holding his legs higher up on his, uh, his body than his feet so that I'm not touching like where the whiskers are, um, which cats don't seem to like. Um, here is the um, cephalic venipuncture or catheter placement. Again, a little bit of distraction. I'm not gonna stretch his leg out until it's needed to be stretched out. Um, cats tend to not like that um, for extended periods of time. So just until they're ready until the person's ready to let the catheter in. Um, lots of cats just like to have a little bit of place to hide. So just using my arm to let them have a little area to hide in there. Here, I'm gonna just tip him over onto his side. So I'm tipping him into my arm. Um, my hand is over his head without a scruff. Um, and then I'm gonna cover his front end. Um, just hold it with my towel. So the front legs aren't available to swat or anything. And now I have his back like pushed out again, just until when the person's ready to draw blood or whatever's needed there. <clears throat> then if I'm, I wanna use the front end, I'm just going to um, cover the back end there. Um, I'm gonna stretch his head out there if we wanted to do a, a jugular puncture there on the side, being you know, a puncture. You know, so I'm petting him uh, between things and trying to get him uh, to trust me. Um, this is just the rolled up blanket technique that I use on the table too. So if he's like just sitting there and I'm gonna do a physical or trim his nails or whatever I'm gonna do, he's sitting there um, with a little barrier. He goes back in by himself. Um, this is the next cat, which 
I'm pretending is a difficult cat. Um, so I've taken the carrier apart. Ideally, we'd have two people in the situation where one person would take the carrier apart and um, take the top off and the other person would be ready with the blanket to go over the cat. And now I have the cat um, immobilized. I know where his head is and I've got him scooping him up with the blanket. I know this picture, he should actually have his legs covered a little better than that. Um, so now I've got him out of the cage. Um, a lot of cats are actually very good just sitting in the bottom of the carrier um, for whatever you have to do. So if you have the carrier taken apart and you have to do some treatments on them or something, then just leaving them in the bottom of the carrier often goes well. See, he's already getting a little annoyed there with his tail. Thing. So here I'm gonna tip him over again as the other cat into my arm. So that's the hand hold for non-scruffing. Um, and then I'm gonna tip him into my arm, um, cover his face. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Um, this is another non-scruffing technique you can use. Like it's sort of like a dog hold where you have your arm over the head. We're getting close to time here. So I'm just gonna skip ahead to those things we, that's just a carrying technique there with the blanket. Um, and getting a cat out of a cage. Um, so approaching the cage with the blanket in front of you. So you're covering your hands. Um, and then I'm gonna um, just quickly and decisively get him under the blanket. My hand is behind his head, so I know where his head is. And then I pushed him into my arms like that. Um, this is an example of a nicer cat. Um, so he's not coming towards me, but I'm just gonna pull the blanket to the edge of the cage. so that I cannot lean my, have to lean my body in, and then I'm just gonna scoop them up. Okay. Um, just a quick difficult cat restraint um, situation here. Um, definitely be prepared. You wanna have a blanket or cat gloves with you. Um, this is a picture of just in a cage where we would be giving, I, like I am uh, intramuscular sedation. So. We just would push the cat to the edge of the cage with a blanket. So in my hand, I know where his head, her head is. I've got my hand behind her head. The other arm is pushing her body against the cage and just leaving enough um, of the body out to give the injection in. Um, so basically our philosophy here in um, what I, I uphold is that the really difficult cats um, if we have to do any handling with them, they should, it should be just really enough to do a quick physical um, and then the, the sedation would happen before we'd have to do anything else. So, you know, not wrestling them to do anything more than that so that we would keep ourselves safe and keep our animals um, not to have to go through those things, those situations. Um, I didn't wanna to put too much about um, doses in here um, but I'll talk a little bit more about gabapentin in a minute. Um, but just doing IM and RIV sedation for difficult cats. Um, we use alfaxone here quite a bit, but keep in mind that it's got a short duration of accent action. So I know here we often get into like, we're doing a bu bunch of other things and then we forget that we've sedated this cat 10 minutes ago and now the sedation's worn off. So just keeping that in mind. And also keeping in mind that um, benzodiazepines like um, Valium or, or midazolam can cause some um, para paradoxical, paradoxical excitement or aggression. So um, 
a little bit about gabapentin. Um, it's a it's a wonderful drug. Um, Emily has told me that it's been used a lot in shelters, um, and I I, I love it. Um, I, we use it quite a bit in the hospital for for patients that are stressed, um, so that we can better treat them, and so they don't have as bad a, a, a you know as as difficult a, a um, hospital stay as they could. Um, it's definitely been seen in, in studies to cause um, reduction in stress and, stress and ag aggression, and certainly in my um, my experience, for sure. Um, we also use e-collars and long lines and you know, do, do our documentation. Um, don't forget about um, food rewards for cats. They, there's some cats that, there's a lot of cats that don't respond to food, especially if they're stressed, um, but there's a lot of cats, there's other cats that really do. And when they do, it's so helpful. Um, so if you have cats that are food motivated, use it to your advantage as much as you can. So um, there's a lot of like pureed foods out there and like different types of treats that they really will like um, and that you will really be able to help you minimize your restraint. Um, cooperative care, I'll, I know we're getting to the end here. So I'm just gonna say really briefly is something that um, is worth looking into. Um, I think it's really helpful um, to help with trust and um, eliminating force. Um, if you can get animals to cooperate with you for whatever you're doing, um, depending on what your outcome, what goal your outcome is, um, it can be something that's a little bit involved or it can be something that's really uh, minimal. And I'll show you really briefly, this is a cat that I had in the hospital that had um, to have blood glucose tests every two hours. So I got her, I figured out she was food motivated, so I got her to cooperate with me for these um, blood tests every two hours, um, which were just um, a, an ear prick blood sample, but um, I thought it worked out really well for her and I. So she likes the, you know, she knows the sound of the treat. She's coming to the edge of the cage. And she wasn't quite ready there, so I'm going to treat. And, just, and that's it. So that went well for us. Um, so some of the take home points I'd like you to um, leave with is um, cooperation and positive experience builds trust. So, you know, looking at that. Um, talked about consistency and predictability is decreasing fear um, with our treatment routines, um, looking at the subtle signs of fear and taking in the whole picture when we're looking at cat behavior. Um, treating each cat as an individual and trying to avoid the stretching and the scruffing. These are a few resources for you. Um, Fear-free pets, um, if you are able to get certified, um, really is helpful. There's a lot of good um, information there on Facebook pages and stuff for fear free um, um, groups and things. And Sophia again, Karen Pryor is a clicker trainer that um, has a lot of good information there. And then we talked about the American Association of Feline Practitioners. Um, so Michelle, we have quite a lot of questions. Um, do you have time to answer some of them? You still there? Oh. Hmm. I think we might have lost our speaker. Are you still there, Michelle? Hmm. 
Okay. Hmm, I guess we're not going to be able to answer questions. I'm just checking here what happened. Oh yeah, we've lost her. Hmm. All right. Well, that's interesting. I'm just going to pull up some of the questions. Thank you for all the comments. Um, and just see if there's any that I can answer quickly. I'm just going to quickly see if I can get her back. All right, let's see. Um, lots of questions here. Um, thanks for all the great comments. Um, we will definitely be putting together um, the slides um, that we can get out to you guys because I've had lots of questions about that. Um, and some good questions about music. So I think one thing that you want to keep in mind is whether or not the cat is socialized um, is going to determine whether some of these techniques um, would apply. Um, and there was a question about do cats tend to hide their pain um, and the pain score? So the pain grimace scale is a way to try to get at that. So basically that scrunched um, facial expression and scrunched body posture, um, those are bad signs for cats. I'm just looking through if there's any other ones here. She answered a lot of these with her talk. And um, there are some lots of questions about getting cats apprehended to bring them in. So you can, one thing you can definitely do is leave the carriers out and try to get the cat um, acclimated to the carrier um, so that they'll go in there for a food treat. And then when you have to bring them in, it's a lot easier. Um, just checking if there are any other ones. Um, oh, and scruffing does not injure cats. So one, one person asked, does scruffing injure the cat or cause it pain? Um, so it definitely, oh, she's trying to log back on, excellent. Um, it definitely doesn't injure them. It's just that it's not stress relieving. So it's not, um, it's not really um, helpful, which is why we're trying to move away from it. There are still some situations where it might be done, but because the cat doesn't like it, we're gonna try to avoid that. And. Oh, yep, she's coming back on, so we'll get her to answer some of these questions here. Um, it is, there was a question here about handling cats under anesthesia. So obviously you're not gonna affect their mental health, but you wanna be careful how you handle them um, because you can cause pain in them when they wake back up if you handle them roughly. All right, Michelle, you're back. Um, are you up for answering some questions? We've got a lot here for you. You there? Let me unmute you. Hmm. Sam? Yep, I can hear you. Are okay. you answering some questions? Yeah. 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 Excellent. Okay. Um, so this I thought was a really great question was um, the person says, I've been having success with minimal restraint on adult cats, but sometimes the younger kittens are harder for me to minimally restrain. I always try food distractions with work for some, but not all. What are your recommendations? That is a good question. Um, uh, definitely the food restraint is, the food is best first. Um, I, I, Sorry, we're trying right. to Sorry, I'm getting an echo because I'm trying to. I had two things open. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, damn. No, you're good. Sorry, it was me. Oh, oh okay. You're okay. Good. All right. Good. <laughs> it's all better. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, other than that, I think it's it's going to be like some distraction techniques um, and something quick. Like if you can get somebody that can do whatever you need to do really quickly um, as you're distracting them with whatever like toys or um, or 
scratching them or doing something like that, I think that's going to be your best bet. Um, if you are in a situation where you have um, you have a, a relationship with the owner, then talking to them about getting them used to being handled more um, is going to be helpful. Um, so those, that's Great. it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, lots of questions about like f differences between socialized cats and feral cats. So um, I know you don't work a lot with feral cats, but do you think that the music works with feral cats? I also don't have that much um, experience with feral cats as far as trying music with them. Um, I, I think it's worth trying for sure, um, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, I, I think that it just... I think it, I, I, I think it would be certainly worth trying, um, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, and then do you think that um, if you don't have the special cat music, is it better to play the radio or to have no music at all? Um, for dogs, they have shown that um, classical music has helped. Um, so I, if I didn't have music for cats, I would probably try something like that. Um, okay. I think more than no music at all. And then, um, one person wanted to know if cats like to have their food and water dishes separated and if so, how far, which is not something that I've ever thought about before. My cats at home have their food and water right next to each other. <laughs> Actually, it has been shown that cats do want their food and water separated. Um, I don't know if there's actually a distance between them, um, but it definitely they want it separated. And there's actually quite a bit of information about how important it is for cats to have clear, wa clean water, like um, very clean water, like um, daily, if not multiple times of day changes of water. Um, so um, it is important. Cool. Um, what about... Um very, very aggressive cats. Is it still okay to use a blanket to get them out of the cage? Uh, a blanket or, or cat gloves, sure. Um, I, I think depending on what your, your goal is, what you need to get done for that time, um, sedation in the cage, I would advocate for. Uh, but if you have to get them out for a quick reason, then yes. And um, here's one that, um, is fostering a feral and she needs to get her in a carrier to take her to her new home. Um, she can't pick her up, she can only pet her head. So I had recommended um, what I know a lot of places do is um, leaving carrier out with treats in it. I guess that's mm -hmm. kind of not a lot of notice for tomorrow, but any suggestions for that one? Yeah, if it's for tomorrow, I it, it is hard. Um, for future reference, I know the American Association of Feline Practitioners has a a really good like step-by-step -step ca carrier acclimation um, information um, that's very helpful. Um, but like, yeah, like keeping the carrier bottom, just the bottom off with like comfortable blankets um, and treats and stuff in there that that's helpful for long-term. For short-term, um, I probably would take the carrier apart um, and pick her up with the blanket and put her in the carrier and then put the top back on. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, and then do you have any, um, would you modify any of the things that you showed if you were, um, if you were using them for older cats? I think like geriatric cats. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I would keep in mind as far as thinking about the individual cat that a uh, older cat might be painful as far as, you know, they might have some arthritis or things like that. Um, other than that, I wouldn't change anything. Great. Um, and then there's a few um, questions about like, do you have specific recommendations for um, gloves um, and specific recommendations for high value treats for cats? Um, gloves, I don't have a lot of experience. I don't I, I, t I typically use blankets more than gloves. There's, I've seen a couple of um, brands and I don't have names for them. I'm sorry, I can find them um, that have like more of a, like sort of a mesh on the outside um, that I've seen people use and that are a little thinner than the gloves I've used before, um, which is the reason why I don't typically like them because it's kind of hard to feel the cats through them. 
Um, so that's, I guess, for gloves. As far as treats go, there's a, a couple of um, a couple of brands of treats that they have now. One of one is called Churro, um, and there's a couple other ones that you can get that are like a paste. It's like a blenderized, um, very um, very stinky kind of um, tuna or chicken kind of food that cats really like. Um, it comes like a, it looks like a like a, a gogurt kind of thing. Um, that cats like a lot. Um, other than that, some cats like soft treats, some cats like hard treats, it's kind of hard to say. Um, dried, dried chicken or, um, or uh, fish treats. Great. Um, I think that got through almost everything. Um, I think the one, one question that we can kind of end on is um, if someone is interested in um, getting Fear Free certified, how would they um, do that? Um, they, they have a website. So if you go on the Fear Free website, um, there's an easy to follow um, sign up thing. Um, and then you go through some um, modules and they test you through each, each module. Um, and then you get certified. And then every year you have to be recertified. Um, so if you want to keep recertifying, basically you just keep moving up until you get to the Fear Free Elite, which is the fourth, fourth level. And then um, every year you just take a test to recertify. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for a great talk and for taking, um, taking the time to answer so many questions. We really, really appreciate it. And um, <laughs> appreciate everyone who turned out tonight. I know everyone's busy and got things to do. So um, thank you very much.